Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the eighth evening of our Cal Universal lecture series on the question of solidarity, concepts, controversies, perspectives, organized by American Studies Professor Kerstin Schmidt and Professor Joost van Loon from Sociology. My name is Natalia Go, and I'm an assistant professor of American Studies at the Catholic University of Eichstätt, Ingolstadt, and I'm representing Kerstin Schmidt, who unfortunately cannot be with us today. The Carne Vasale lecture series takes place in every fall term, always with a different topic. It's actually directed at students from various disciplines and will bring them together. But it's also open to the public in an effort to reach out the, of the ivory tower and to connect. While most lectures will be in German, tonight's talk, along with four others during the term, will be in English, um, which is why my short introduction in English um, is also in English. We started the lecture series on November 9th with an official kickoff event uh, with Wolfgang Benz, longtime director of the Research Center on Antisemitism uh, at the Technical University of Berlin. He talked about solidarity, mostly the lack thereof, during the Reichskristallnacht on November 9th. Then our guest was uh, Klaus Dörre from the University of Jena. He talked about what he calls exclusive solidarity in the labor movement and labor unions. Nicole Schneider of our own American Studies Department analyzed forms of visual protest with regard to the movement for Black Lives. Frank Adloff from the University of Hamburg sketched ways to practice solidarity with non-human life. And Armin Nassé of Munich's LMU talked about the nature of protest. KU professor Jörg Althammer talked about the market and solidarity. And just before Christmas, Cassandra, uh, Chandra Talpade Mohanty from Syracuse University in the US spoke about anti-racist struggles and insurgent feminist practice in border situations around the world. All talks are still available on KU's YouTube channel. This is perhaps among the very few benefits that virtual life under the dictate of the virus has in store. Tonight's talk is located at the intersection of theories of nonviolence with ethical poetics uh, so in a way, I expect us to look at literature, the arts, and their role in and the contribution to the contested and often abused terrain of solidarity. The new year is just a few days old, and it has already been inundated by images of violent mobs attacking seamlessly, effortlessly institutions of democracy. Since we are in education and we train future teachers, it is all the more important to draw attention, to provide knowledge, to foster critical and dedicated discussion. The times are trying and demand both kindness and courage to large and maybe extraordinary degrees. So in many ways, this evening is also a call to stand in solidarity with everyone working toward democracy, actually securing democracy and denouncing extremism and both acute and systemic violence. In order to do the job of educating us further, we invite people over to talk about their research on the promising but also complex topic of solidarity from a variety of perspectives. It is my particular pleasure to introduce to you tonight's speaker, Giovanna Covey. Giovanna is a professor of Anglo-American literature and gender studies at the University of Trento in Italia. Her research focuses on feminist post-colonial theory with reference to African-American, Afro-Caribbean literatures by women. She's committed to nourishing the dialogue between the academy and social movements and to bridging the gap between theory and practice. Her commitment to teaching has brought her to bridge the gap between the context of her discipline, the United States of America, and the context familiar to her European students. As a result, her focus on US post-structural feminist theory is regarded in relation to the European philosophies of difference. So she reads, for example, Judith Butler, Donna Haraway, and Karen Barat together with Luce Irigaray, Rosi Braidotti, and Adriana Cavarero in pursuit of a shared discourse uh, beyond heteronormativity. Likewise, her focus on critical race theory in relation to the Americas has led her to investigate both the in history of Italian colonialism and the contemporary shaping of Italian culture under the influence of migration. Overall, she's committed to transnational discourses aimed at social justice, as witnessed by her engagement with Lila Gandhi's theory in the past decade. Her publications include essays on the fiction of Michelle Cliff, Jamaica Kincaid, Una Marson, and Toni Morrison, 
and the poetry of Emily Dickinson, Joanne Amnado, Adrienne Rich, and Nikki Giovanni. She has participated in and coordinated a number of international research networks, including the group's traveling concepts and researchers in Athena, advanced thematic network in European women's studies. There's also the H uh, RC project behind the looking glass, other cultures within translating cultures. She edited numerous collaborative volumes, including interculturality and gender, Caribbean Scottish relations, modernist women race nation, and perspective from the cultural other. She's currently responsible for the Trento unit of the project UNIRE, a European academic network to contrast violence against women and foster uh, through education and cultural production, the implementation of the Istanbul Convention. Current pandemic safety measures prescribe that we cannot have an audience or meet in person. But as always, there's a chance to submit questions during or directly after the talk via KU's Facebook channel or via Vimeo for KU Universale students. Questions will be forwarded to me and I'll ask them for you, at least as many as possible, after the talk and a conversation between the two of us which should also give us give you all some time to type your questions and comments. Giovanna's title is The Poetics of Solidarity and Mercy for Practicing Nonviolence. I'm looking forward to your talk and I'll hand over to you, Giovanna. Thank you, thank you very much. I hope uh, everybody can hear me. Uh, thank you, Natalie, for this very generous introduction, and thank you, Kirsten Schmidt, and uh, for the invitation, uh, Michael Winkman for helping me out, uh, getting organized to get in touch with this uh, uh, thought-provoking program uh, of the Katholische Universität uh, Eichstätt, Ingolstadt, on solidarity. Solidarity is really uh, a concept that uh, uh, we need to rethink uh, in order to face uh, the challenges of, uh, of the present. Um, and my talk uh, is actually aimed at facing the humongous challenge of violence that is tearing our world apart in so many ways. Uh, the objective of my talk, and I could actually share uh, a sketchy outline of my abstract to, to facilitate uh, communication here. The objective of my talk is to engage uh, theories of no nonviolence, mainly by Lila Gandhi, but also by Judith Butler in addition to uh, definitions of mercy provided by Brian Stevenson and Emanuela Zurli, together with the ethical poetics expressed uh, mainly by Michelle Cliff uh, in her novel, Free Enterprise, a novel of Mary Ellen Pleasant, uh, with comparative remarks that include uh, Phyllis Whitley's uh, well-known poem on being brought from Africa to America, written in 1773, Toni Morrison's novel, A Mercy, 2008, and uh, Kaha Mohamed Aden's fable, La Disfavola degli Elefanti, published in 2019. My talk argues for the urgent necessity of building a radical democracy rooted in the cultural revolution of an everyday practice of high negativity, including civil disobedience, of an ethics of imperfection and of a politics of becoming less, of becoming minor. It contends that this requires confronting the crisis of modernity by reframing the concepts of freedom and solidarity and by inflecting politics together with poetics. It suggests that a redefinition of mercy as tender love and as justice provides the tools for this necessary ethical turn. And it offers a reading of Cliss narrative as exemplary of what I call merciful solidarity. Solidarity. Um, 
I think it is more of a proposition than a concept. Europe, as you know, was declaredly, declaredly born out of the will of its founders for uh, solidarity. Solidarity being an aporetic term, the classical rooting solidarity is in the law. It's in money and in soldiers. From the juridical Latin phrase in solidum obligari, obligation to pay one's debt in solidum, meaning in full, entire, complete, whole, from which the Italian words soldo, money, and soldato derive. The modern rooting of solidarity is in community. The French Revolution solidarité stretches its meaning to the social sphere. The nationalist feeling of fraternity shared by citizens within democracy associated with political freedom and equality. The 1848 International Workers' Movement enlarges its meaning to include ethics, mutual help, social and class solidarity, support for a common struggle for labor and civil rights beyond national boundaries. And social solidarity is further defined from socialist and also from liberal standpoints afterwards, rooting its meanings in politics. In contemporary times, through international organizations, solidarity expresses the dream for a humanity that is commonly shared. And Europe appears today to be understanding solidarity, which is its founding concept, uh, in a schizophrenic way, unable to join its foundational modern ideal with its classical praxis. The Greek crisis and the Brexit have obviously exploded this aporia. The double rooting of solidarity, technical and nominal on the one hand, ideological and material on the other, raises a question which can be phrased in various terms. When we perceive a society as solidary, does it solidly derive from its budget or from its ethics? Does a solid society guarantee that it is also a solidary society? Is the material physical solid body of a solid society capable of opening itself to the risk of open mutual reciprocity? Is a society that we consider solid and solidary an ethical society, one that refers to human behavior performed in relation to collective action, to the intercultural exchange that produces shared meanings and values? Well, certainly uh, there is no straightforward answer to this question because we are living a moment of crisis, what we call the crisis of modernity. And within this crisis of modernity, uh, we need to acknowledge the fact that we still use uh, the Cold War rhetoric. The Cold War rhetoric that casts liberalism and individual freedom versus socialism and collective solidarity, capitalism versus communism, freedom versus solidarity, as if it was always a conflict, a war. This rhetoric is built on the relation between the individual and society as the subject-object dichotomy. And it is the subject-object dichotomy that we need to rethink. We need a different radical rethinking of human freedom and its constitutive relation to the surrounding social and natural world, as, for example, Fred Dahlmeier argues, in which solidarity is not cast any longer as an antithesis to freedom. Dahlmeier again says that the move beyond mod modernity towards uh, freedom and solidarity as uh, conceived as mutually compatible uh, was already indicated by Martin Heidegger who calls authentic solidarity the co-being that gives freedom a place in the midst of sociality a social bonding in which all participants remain freely open to their own possibilities, a community without communalism. The relation between self and others is primary for Heidegger, as you all remember. Being in the world means precisely that human Dasein is not itself sufficient or self-contained and that world, including all other beings, is constitutive of the very meaning of Dasein. 
human being in the world implies not only a factual coexistence, but also a bond of mutual ethical responsibility, the obligation of caring, of letting be, of serving the well-being of the community. Freedom is compatible with a strong sense of solidarity, and solidarity is compatible with a strong sense of freedom. And Dahlmeier says uh, that uh, in order to transcend the crisis of modernity, uh, we need to face uh, the aporetic status of freedom, which depends on its cognitive theoretical framing within the subject object paradigm. It, a paradigm within which the subject either surrenders to external determinism or is reduced to private solipsism. Its enigma can be resolved only through an action that is not willfully self-centered, but is rather self-transcending in the direction of social solidarity. The Indian Bhagavad Gita celebrates self-transcending or non-attached praxis as an eminent passageway to freedom. And this uh, brings me to a uh, foreground uh, the concept of uh, solidarity based on uh, himsa or non-injuriousness uh, that Lila Gandhi has uh, so richly articulated for us uh, in many of her publications. Solidarity as non-injuriousness uh, uh, is uh, derived from the idea that thought, philosophy in our times, should dwell on quotidian sorrow, should engage the problem of suffering from a vitalist perspective, like blues and jazz have done. Thought should focus on discourses of transformation in which states of injury, of instrumental harm, of suffering, become the base for exchange and solidarity between disparate agents. The refusal to be harmed can paradoxically take either the form of violence, as in slave rebellion, or commit to unconditional nonviolence, as in the civil rights movement. Uh, Lila Gandhi uh, considers uh, the main philosophical voices of uh, the 20th century from Heidegger's uh, ontology, which casts being as part of an inclusive composite reality through Nietzsche's will to power, which is invoked, uh, uh, she critically says, uh, uh, too strongly by political ontology through Derrida's concept of hospitality as that infinite openness towards any other who may show up unexpectedly, unannouncedly. And uh, she also is in dialogue with Judith Butler's precariousness, uh, uh, which calls for mindfulness uh, towards the life we share with others. Butler writes, loss has made a tenuous we of us all. And of course, Levinas, uh, whose counter ontology is against any system of indivisibility that masks uh, the relationships. So uh, she claims that we need an ethical turn in critical theory. We need much more than collectivity and we need much more than solidarity. What do we need then according to Gandhi? We need relationality and intersubjectivity. We need to be, she says, an anarchist whose wish not to rule must be always greater than the wish not to be ruled. She calls the solidarity solidarities in the plural and qualifies it as transnational philoxenic solidarities, um, defined as a network of anti-colonial alliances based on the politics of, of friendship, as affectionate singularities that share their in-betweenness, their partage, and offer a vision of a non-communitarian understanding of a hospital community, always a veneer, always to come. A sociality that is never self-identical because it is always open to new arrivals. And in this sense, 
her philosophy is in direct dialogue with Judith Butler's idea of nonviolent resistance and nonviolent solidarity. Nonviolent solidarity is that unpredictable assemblage without a leader, a solidarity that is possible only if it, is, if, if it subscribes to the principle of nonviolence which is an active struggle with a cultivated form of constraint that takes corporeal and collective form. And I, under, I underline corporeal form. There are bodies there all the time. There's no ideal solidarity here. Nonviolent resistance means encountering violence without reproducing it terms because nonviolent movements cannot simply be war by other means. And um, together with these redefinitions of solidarity, contemporary definitions of solidarity, I would like to offer also two, uh, for me, crucial definitions of mercy. The first is, uh, is by Emma, Emanuela Zurli, uh, who notices uh, that uh, in the Gospels, the Greek phrase Kyrie eleison appears 10 times and it is translated into English as Lord have mercy on us. But she also notices that in Italian it is translated as Signore Pietà, i.e. Lord pity us. Zurli argues that in the, in the original Aramaic language, the meaning is focused on love rather than pardon, than forgiveness. The appeal is thus for God to love us gratuitously as a mother, not for God to forgive our sins as a judging father. This second meaning of forgiveness derives from the translations into Greek and Latin. Zurli suggests that a translation closer to the original into Italian would be Signore amami teneramente, Lord love me tenderly. Mercy, therefore, should remain gratuitous, like a deridian gift. It should retain the African-American practice of signifying where forgiveness and judgment are coupled with uncalled for generosity and human understanding. Zurli's translation evokes tender affects and shared feelings, a call for mercy signaling inclusion rather than division, signifying the acceptance of poetic reason, which does not eschew desire, affects, incoherency. This definition of mercy as tender love, not judgment and justice, not forgiveness, points towards solidarity, towards the radical democracy called for by Lila Gandhi, grounded on ahimsaic subjects who embrace an ethics of imperfection. Another definition of, of, of mercy that uh, I want to use here is offered by Brian Stevenson in his uh, book, Just Mercy, published in 2015. In his poignant uh, essay on mass incarceration in the USA, which is a political form as you all know, of prolonged slavery, Stevenson makes a passionate call for mercy, for compassion, as the only way to save the community, the state and the nation. He argues for a fundamental epistemological term. He says, the opposite of poverty is not wealth, but justice, and specifies, mercy is most empowering, liberating and transformative when it is directed at the undeserving. He calls for a mercy that is freely given and his argument is displayed by telling us story after story of his own proximity as a lawyer with people who have been labeled criminals. In Lila Gandhi's terms, he becomes minor through his own practice rather than through the power of the law. Thus, the concept of mercy as tender love, not judgment, and as justice, not forgiveness, reframes the, questions of, the question of justice. The question is no longer, do they deserve to die, but rather, do we deserve to kill? There are numerous literary sources that uh, help us make sense of these philosophies uh, 
um, that give body through stories uh, and uh, lyrics uh, uh, to these ideas. Starting with Phyllis Whitley, the first uh, African-American poet uh, and her well known on being brought uh, from Africa to America, um, which starts uh, with, it was mercy brought me from my pagan land. And we understand that the concept of mercy here uttered by an enslaved uh, young uh, woman expresses the play between sovereignty and relationality. Mercy is defined as a two way relation. There is no active giver and passive receiver in this ironic utterance. Whitley signifies she delivers double talking in both major and minor tone. There is no judgment and no forgiveness in her use of the term mercy, only tender love for justice. Hers is an example of merciful solidarity. Another example of merciful solidarity is uh, in Toni Morrison's novel, A Mercy. The novel distills the essence of American identity with its claim to liberty and its grounding in slavery of the natives, the indentured servants and the deported Africans. Mercy refers to the passage of a girl by her slave mother from one form of slavery into another. The year of the telling is 1690, the place, Virginia Colony, the name of the girl, Florence. The incipit brings readers right into the story. Don't be afraid, my telly can't hurt you. Morrison shows us that mercy can have unforeseeable effects, that it is a relation whose definition is reciprocal and unstable, not a charity delivered by the sovereign to the subjected. It is tender love, not judgment, and justice, not forgiveness. It is merciful solidarity. The other text uh, that unfortunately I cannot uh, share uh, with you uh, because uh, it's published only in Italian uh, is written by uh, an Italian writer uh, of Somalian origin who has always helped uh, me, I hope, uh, become a little bit of a better teacher because teaching American studies without uh, seeking connections in our own uh, context, uh, uh, I thought was always sterile. And Kaha Mohammed Aden's stories uh, have always been a source of great inspiration. Her most recent Dalmar, La Disfatta degli Elefanti, is a fable. It's a fable that takes us uh, through um, the 1990s Somalian civil war and ethnic massacres. A group of walking beings, as she calls the elephants, escapes the war-torn savanna where armed traffic is in the hands of mice and rats. As you can see, it's a fable, you know, pretend that you're young adults uh, reading it. Um, they escape to take refuge on an unknown island inhabited by bears, apparently living peacefully, although autocratically ruled by the club of the respectable stringes, who could not care less whether there is order or chaos as long as they can make money, and by a general who is now called the barber, who has banned memory of the clanic massacres of the past. The encounter between the saddle bears and the nomadic elephants, democratically guided by Idman, is difficult, but with the help of the bees and a couple of turtles, also hopeful. The Dis Favola is a utopian dystopian fable about democracy and dictatorship, about mobility and encounters among differences. The hope for change into a nonviolent future of cohabitation is expressed by the friendship between Dalmar, the elephant calf, and Drita, the bear cub. Sharing is not only possible, but also an advantage for everybody 
for bears, elephants, and bees. Everybody changes in the end. Even the walking beings say, let's go home. Edmund's intelligence leads everybody out of the simplistic impasse, war versus peace, us versus them. She understands the complexity of the world because she transcends individual and group identities and she engages acts of reciprocal mercy, hospitality and friendship. Her action allows for the restoration of memory within the Bears community and for a responsible management of the encounters among different species that takes all, everybody, beyond peace as the mere absence of war. Mercy as mutual giving of tender love and justice points towards practicing nonviolence as becoming less, as an ethics of imperfection, as the politics of polysemic sharing and cohabitation. Again, as merciful solidarity. The next uh, and last uh, textual example that I want to make uh, is uh, the novel <clears throat> um, um, sorry, the novel Free Enterprise uh, uh, written by Michelle Cliff. Uh, I cannot introduce Michelle Cliff uh, without introducing her together with the, the woman with whom she shared her life. Uh, they both uh, writer, Michelle Cliff and poet Adrian Rich, uh, both of them uh, theorists uh, and militant uh, women spent uh, their life together in uh, Santa Cruz, uh, uh, California. Santa Cruz uh, since uh, 1975 and up to their uh, deaths. Santa Cruz in the 80s, uh, uh, as, um, as some of you probably recall, uh, was uh, the hotbed of a praxis of feminist queer collaborative thinking, a discourse uh, seeking alliances to act in the world, crossing boundaries, refiguring epistemic paradigms struggling for social justice of all bodies and a pacifist and post-colonial ethics of cohabitation. Uh, with Adrienne Rich and Michelle Cliff, the dialogue uh, was nourished by Teresa de Lauretis, Donna Haraway, Judith Butler, Audre Lorde, Gloria Ansaldua, Cherry Moraga, Grace Paley, Barbara Kingslover, Susan Brown Miller, and many others. So uh, if uh, it is in this context uh, that uh, the novel Free Enter Enterprise uh, is born. And the point uh, uh, that uh, I want to make about free enterprise uh, is uh, in this quotation, uh, that uh, every constituency, every uh, individual identity should be treated uh, as a living, breathing human being. That's, that's at the heart of, uh, of, uh, of this novel. Uh, it's a narrative about uh, John Brown's armed revolution against uh, slavery. Uh, and it frames uh, revolutionary history as nonviolent epistemology. It does so because it was Adrian Rich who had theorized a revolutionary poetics. Adrian Rich says that a revolutionary poetic stands in the middle of life and talks back, acts as part of the world. It is an exchange of energy, which in changing consciousness can effect change in existing conditions. It does not tell though never who or when to kill. It does not even tell us how to theorize. It only makes us look at things otherwise. It forces upon us always constantly the compelling question, what if? Cliff is uh, a novelist, but uh, she was trained as a historian and uh, all, uh, her being a historian is always uh, very visible in all of her storytelling. She uses history, legend, fiction to tell the story of those excluded from the history of slavery. 
And uh, she uses uh, in this sense uh, what uh, Lila Gandhi defined as a himsaic nonviolent historiography, a historiography that is a transnational ethical history of projects uh, for self ruination, a radical affiliative relationality of the unimportant of the minor, a history of democracy as practices of the self that are ordinary and thus possible, a history that is textual and as such embraces the poetic principle of ambiguity, a history that expresses and interprets and performs hope against hope and calls for aspirational actions, for poetic visions, for imaginative analysis. It is a hermeneutics born of moral imperfectionism. It's uh, sorry. It's uh, it's not possible uh, to give you a plot summary of free enterprise. It is too complex. The stories, the minor stories. Uh, that multiplicate in this text are, are far too many. Uh, let us be content with knowing, for those of you who haven't read it, that it is about John Brown's armed revolution against slavery. Uh, its poetics gives life to radical politics through the framing of revolutionary history as nonviolent epistemology through a story of armed revolution that is paradoxically grounded on a nonviolent episteme. It produces epistemic twists continuously that radically innovate our understanding of the economics of slavery and that queer the representations of gendered, sexualized, and racialized subjectivities. The narrative revolves around two women. The historical figure of Mary Ellen Pleasant and the fictional character of Annie Christmas, based on the Mississippi tall tales about the strong female captain who feared nobody on the Mississippi. Any Christmas is also a historical autobiographical fig, uh, figure uh, because uh, like uh, Michelle Cliff, uh, she comes from Jamaica and she lives on the edge of the most marginalized community, the leper community on a cabin, which uh, next to it uh, has uh, a bottle tree. Bottle trees, as you can see in this picture, as a tr are a tradition of the African-American South, so that the bottles capture the bad spirits. Uh, Mary Ellen is a historical figure. Any Christmas is uh, somewhat uh, fictional or legendary, uh, but becomes, uh, uh, but becomes uh, autobiographical, so fiction and, uh, and history are always intertwined. More than profound revision of slave history told by two women, the narrative breaks the grounding of contemporary episteme and helps us think differently about change, about decolonization and transformation of the present. It shows how subjectivities, communities, and affective relations are formed in resistance and are grounded in reciprocity. It redefines resistance and revolution as everyday praxis, as common. Mary Ellen Pleasant, the historical figure, becomes legendary. Annie Christmas, the legendary heroine of African-American tall tales, becomes autobiographical. The tangle is between fact and fiction all the time. The plot unfolds as a continuous variation of major and minor tones, resembling Harry Parch's eutonal music, a music which allows us to hear the minor and the major simultaneously. 
Gandhi refers specifically to Parch in her essay, Utonal Life, to explain the colonial encounter between an imperial variant that present, presents as a model of sovereignty and an anti-imperial variant that presents as a model of relationality. And I claim that Cliff presents such coexistence of major and minor as resistance to domination. The title itself is an act of double talking of African-American signifying. Taken at face value, free enterprise not only captures the core of capitalism, the reason for the institution of slavery, but also communicates ironically the glorious enterprises of resistance to slavery. This double meaning is superbly personified in the historical figure of Barry Allen Pleasant, who fought for the dignity and rights of the enslaved Black people with strong determination and with comparable, comparable willpower, struggled for her own economic independence and success, becoming a capitalist abolitionist, free Black woman in San Francisco, where she pioneered the history of civil rights in the middle of the 19th century. Pleasant supposedly met John Brown in Canada in 1858, one year before Brown's defeat at Harper's Ferry, and donated $30,000 to his cause of slave rebellion. Cliff makes Pleasant meet Annie Christmas in the same year. Annie had come from Jamaica to fight with Brown. After his defeat, she retreats on the border of the Carvey Leper colony in a cabin with a body and joins people who remember a world before colonization. The two women fighters meet at a restaurant called Free Enterprise. Annie is dressed like a man and Mary Ellen invites her to choose a female name as her battle name. She says, it's all well and good to dress as a man in the cause, my dear, but for heaven's sake, take a nom de guerre fit for a woman. Clearly, these women self-consciously manage the social significance of masculinity and femininity to pursue their goals and do so without mimicking patriarchal power, without surrendering their being who they are. Rather, they take the risk of experimenting with their being women through a performance of masculinity and femininity according to their own needs, desires, and wills. After examining legendary female figures such as the great nanny of the Maroons, and his choice of her battle name is industry. Industry is an enslaved African woman who served the Jean Inconnu, whom Annie loved as a child. Industry would tell her stories about the Maroons, and industry stubbornly fought for her own freedom, but succumbed. Annie admits that, unable to save her, she saved herself instead. The two women fighters never mention John Brown and never discuss the idea of revolution in the abstract. Revolution is not presented as a metaphysical utopia, but rather pragmatically constructed through a relation between women built on ordinary, everyday experience. Revolution is defined through a consciousness-raising practice. Clearly, it is so in Chapter 2 in the leper colony, where we meet individuals who are so diminished in their humanity that they are distinguished only by a number instead of a name. They start a storytelling group that rewrites the history of modern colonization through a multivocal and intercultural circle that effectively creates a coalition of humans constituted by diverse relations to the flowing of the telly rather than by identity categories. Here we meet a third woman, number 11,246. Her name is Rachel. She is the wandering Jew who assures placeless Annie that once told, the stories do not die. Their kinship displays identities that are relational, both in their own self-construction and in the construction of their new community. Resilience and resistance are built on the adaptation to and the queering 
of the continuous and diverse flowing of their multivocal intercultural fragmented, translated and dialogical narration. Please note uh, the floor of uh, the synagogue made of sand so that it muffles uh, the voices and the sounds uh, so that you can be in the hiding. And Rachel's voice is always described as being so soft that nobody could hear it. This is an actual photograph uh, of uh, the synagogue in Suriname, which still has uh, the sandy floor in it. Rachel's story is followed by the story of number 12,548, a Kentucky woman who tells us about Mammoth Cave, where Africans mixed with Indians, Cherokee and Creek and all kinds, half breeds, quarter breeds, whatever, they call themselves maroons, and they mined the caverns for lead and zinc, lived and came up only to trade with her white father. Her story ends with an act of institutional violence. The militia came down to Ultima Thule to kill and behead on the charge of what they called servile conspiracy to commit revolution. This story of state violence perpetrated on the assumption of revolution is told from the point of view of the victims whose vulnerability is conceived as political agency. This way it dehumanizes. Uh, <clears throat> the criminals instead of the victims, thereby dismantling the paradigm of the assumed legitimacy within which the state acts. Furthermore, the story represents a search for nonviolence in revolutionary practice, instead of resting on the easy embrace of metaphysical peace. Centered on John Brown's armed insurrection, free enterprise explicitly addresses the issue of the reproduction of violence in a revolutionary context and understands racism as a complex matter entangled with economy and the possession of women. This perspective may be usefully employed to reconsider modernity at large and understand how to make democracy more fully and to begin by see, seeing its origin in the coupling of the traditional American and French revolutions with the numerous slave rebellions occurring in the Caribbean and the US mainland since the 1790s to mark the history of democracy with an enduring tension between radical and liberal positions, to acknowledge major as well as minor episodes, to glorify, in other words, John Brown without dismissing Harriet Tubman. By articulating the tensions between liberal history and radical counter history, Cliff provides an alternative moral and political framing within which to understand the various events in their full complexity. This is more than mere inclusion or juxtaposition. It requires employing imagination and fiction in the historical framing, employing in theory to reconceptualize the very ideas of revolution and democracy. This revision is accomplished through a dialogical articulation of the issues at stake through a narration that moves from story circle to epistolary form, from lyric verses to symbols, in a relentless search for a language that does not force lives into predefined categories. Issues are presented by an eye that speaks with a new. And through their exchanges, confrontations, and agreements, they examine the very core of the question of slavery and consider which participants in the abolitionist movement are truly prepared to consider the slaves fully human and how so. Cliff's narrative is radical not because it thematizes revolution nor because it retells the history of John Brown from the point of view of two women, but rather because it brings the you with the I into the story. Her telling engages a demasculinization of subjecthood by which self-invention 
may be cast outside the endless repetition of colonial violence. It is indeed because Mary Ellen and Annie are first met as they self-consciously and freely construct gender when Annie dressed like a man chooses a woman's name that free enterprise contributes uh, to the reshaping of humanism on nonviolent grounding around an I and a U in relation rather than around men. Cliff's narrative ad adopts uh, throughout this form of I and U address uh, as a form of nonviolent militancy, anarchism, disobedience, no saying, non normative practice, rejection of categorizations in the encounter between Mary Ellen and Annie in the story circle in final epistolary pages. Uh, everything is meant to show how to be common with others. Chapter three begins with the letter written to Annie by Mary Ellen about uh, Joseph Turner's uh, 1840 painting, Slavers, uh, very well known painting, Slavers throwing overboard the dead and dying, typhoon coming on. The letter takes us into the world of the abolitionist white ladies, uh, their salons, uh, their black servants, where Mary Ellen is invited, invited by Alice Hooper, for the unveiling of the painting. And Mary Ellen will leave distressed and in silence. There are different interpretations of the painting underline their fundamental difference. While Alice Hooper focuses on the whiteness of the storm at its center and compares it to Melville's narrative, Mary Ellen focuses on the foreground, on uh, the brown leg, of the drowning slave surrounded by fish. But Cliff does not lead us beyond this juxtaposition. Uh, but, but, Cliff, but, but, but Cliff leads us beyond this juxtaposition to seek a change in the framing itself, a method that makes convergences and connections available so that history is not simply told differently or in more voices, but told in ways that were previously unthinkable, unimaginable. Cliff shows how to break the silence about the obscure moments when transformations have become to take place so that they are no longer locked within paradigms and orders that foreclose. Their telling suggests that there were other conditions of possibility, conditions to pursue what might otherwise have been. Turner's slave ship is placed at the center of an exchange between liberal and radical democracy that smashes the standard opposition between politics and aesthetics and presents the painting instead as a political production of knowing which changes the paradigm in order to be able to focus on the foreground, we understand Alice Hooper must first agree that the Africans are fully human. She must lessen herself and her culture and ahimsaically touch the you that she wants to save, the you of the drowning slave. Alice must reach for a bodily touch, feel the you in order to explain the you to herself, first of all, because abstract understanding is obviously not enough. Cliff's narration does not turn away from Alice because of her obvious imperfection, but follows her in the relation with her cousin Clover right away to point out that it is cru crucial to close the divide between spectating life like tourists and becoming real, descending into it, striding through it with intent between fighting for the ideal of freedom and struggling for the freedom of one's own bodies. In this chapter, we also meet Mary Ellen's family, a family of freedom fighters that leads us into maroon communities in the Adirondacks, Canada, the Caribbean, at Fort Mose in Florida, where Blacks fought for freedom, as well as at the cage in Montego Bay, Jamaica, where runaway slaves were imprisoned. The telling becomes lyrical at this point. It becomes lyrical to search through the past to move among impalpable items. Cliff nourishes our imagination about the sounds and meanings of the languages spo spoken by the Arawaks 
with graphic signs. As if to underline that in order to accomplish a radical revision of kinship, a linguistic revolution is also needed. Mary Ellen's mother was killed in a raid in 1825. Mary Ellen inherited her revolver. After Brown's execution during her escape, she met a group of white racist teens who threatened to capture and take her into slavery to Virginia. She killed and burned them and then posted a sign on a tree saying, these were some mean niggers. You owe me a favor, signed a gentleman. This warning is clearly another act of linguistic revolution, the lexical choice, a double saying like the signature. Although free enterprise thematized armed insurrection against slavery, no acts of violence perpetrated by the insurrectionists are included except this one. This, however, is not a planned insurrection. Rather, it is an extreme act of responsive violence by a woman when treated sexually like prey. This is no mimic reversal of the colonial paradigm. On the contrary, it is a material action of personal survival and a rhetorical act of signifying. The narrative at this point clarifies the basic difference between Mary Ellen and John Brown. She objects to his notion of an African state as a Christo utopia, a romantic vision which she immediately detects as a claim of ownership, she says, as potentially degrading and damaging as enslavement. Instead, Mary Ellen positions herself like Franz Fanon, who asks, was my freedom not given to me then in order to build the world of the you? And this way she participates in a redefinition of humanism outside the colonial paradigm. Such uncompromisingly radical political positioning is made explicitly in her letter to Annie, where she indirectly asks John Brown, why not allow us to be human? Are we to be made a shining example of the impossible or be treated as a group of living, breathing human beings? And she adds, I dread the notion of suffering into redemption. This is a crucial remark, a remark that lifts the victims from their stake to victimhood and makes them human. And defiantly, she reminds the captain, hey, she says, we do not wish to enslave the enslavers, underlining that a reversal of roles within the power system can only be avoided if the system itself is changed. If the light is, if, if the fight, pardon me, is for eliminating power rather than taking it over. Only in this way may the revolution avoid replicating the violence it is opposing. If on the contrary, power is figured as masculine and superhuman, also by the revolutionary imaginary, the enslaved can only picture their vindication in terms of another worldly people, triumphant in their redemption that originates in their suffering, but is confined within the kingdom of God and is still excluded from the sharing of this world, the realm of the possible. On the contrary, Mary Ellen's representation pursues uh, lived lives uh, imperfectly by fragments with interruptions through listening to different modes, tongues, positions, and in search of affiliations. No single narrative nor homogenous picture can contain the politics of her temporary location because it is defined by moral imperfectionism. Perfection, we should remember, is the violent modality of dominant power, of totalitarianism, colonialism, but also of liberalism within globalization. Perfection is the single voice of masculinist power, only capable of replacing one man with another man instead of sharing the vision imperfectly, interlocutorily, and worldly between the I and the you. Right when Mary Anna Mary Ellen is shown perpetrating violence. She has killed the sons of the South and with cold calculation also concealed the murder. 
we are made to understand that she is a non-violent fighter. Cliff's narrative has prepared us to accept surprising and incoherent turns like in our lived lives. The contradiction is only apparent. She dreads the pacification of her people because she knows that violence can take turns. She has experienced it herself, both as a victim and as a perpetrator. Mary Ellen lays out a pragmatic plan for the here and now of human temporality becoming common in order to build a community and sharing the property and saying yes even to capital. Damn it, she declares with defiant voice. Our people knew capitalism intimately, historically. Overturning power, which in this world is capital, does not mean eliminating power, but sharing it. And as Mary Ellen closes her memories of the past, she is holding a newspaper that announcing, announces the lynchings in her present time. The fight continues with the awareness that the elimination of violence cannot always be peaceful. Mary Ellen's letters contain words of deep affection, not of sexual desire, only affection for any. They express her unselfish acceptance of her difference, not of their sameness. Annie's masculine identity is depicted as common, and so are other lesbians we encounter in this complex narrative. Lesbians are always fully human. Before the closing of Free Enterprise, we read Anne's only letter to Mary Ellen. Annie and Rachel live in the leper colony. They have formed a community. They have forged new kinship. And they keep uh, each other what they call tender company by exchanging story and by keeping on admiring Mary Ellen. We learn that Annie too has killed two white women. They were naked bathing where she had gone to water her horse. She was dressed like a man, her skin was dark. At the sight of what the bathing women thought was a black man, they started screaming in terror, and he shot them. Like the episode where Mary Ellen shoots the boys, this passage is worded as scanty factual report. It happened a few days before Brown's defeat, when the maroon camp in which Annie lived was raided. Indian and African women were killed before the eyes of the men. The men were chained together, any with them until her sex was discovered. Her chained body was then the target of violence by the chained men. When she was being raped, all any could think of was industry, the slave she could not save. Annie's letter concludes sharply. This is the story I do not tell. Henny Lude, who leads the story cycle in the leper colony, can only share the telling of her own deepest suffering with Mary Ellen. And he kills, we may say, for a translation mistake. The mainstream paradigm dictates that women are raped by men, as we know. Annie is the victim of male violence as a woman. When she appears dressed like a man in front of vulnerable women, these read her as a threat. But there is an interference in the message in the intersection between racism and sexism. The women are white and she appears as a black man. Outnumbered, she can only kill. Hers too is responsive violence, although triggered by a figurative instead of literal understanding. The very closing pages are filled with poetry, slave poetry, the poetry written by the first African-American woman in colonial times, Phyllis Whitley, whom we have already met in this talk. Perhaps only poetry can be uttered after Annie's suffering without transcending or displacing it. Perhaps only poetry can dive under the surface of the ocean below the fish and the slave slag in Turner's painting. Perhaps only poetry can let Mary Ellen see the bones in the sand and hear the silence at the bottom of the Black Atlantic to honor the victims of the trade. Perhaps only poetry can tell the paradox I do dare emphasize in my conclusion. 
Free Enterprise tells the story of two women who joined the armed revolution and killed and nevertheless embraced nonviolent revolution. Neither Mary Ellen nor Annie raised to the status of hero, heroines. As Annie explicitly puts it, I am a uniquely ordinary human being to which Mary Allen replies by silencing herself and letting Whitley's poetry speak. Cliff's free enterprise places exclusion and lack of recognition at the center of the materiality of political economy. It displays an effective community made of people who are not fixed into abstract taxonomies, but are rather pulled together by their relations, by their merciful solidarity for their community, never against another, actively engaged in the making of radical democracy, which can only be made, albeit imperfectly, of and by the people, all the people. To the question, what kept them going, referring to the enslaved, Cliff's text answers, people, their own, that's all they had. Well, we need to understand that these are not the people made through representation. These are the people made through acts of self-making, poetic enunciation and aspiration. The guns that Mary Ellen and Annie carry are a legacy of motherly tender love. They are meant to be used defensively and contingently only where there is a specific I and a you at play. Mercifully, we might say, they are not at the center of masculinist replacing of a man with another man. Their mercy is just because it's directed at the undeserving and therefore becomes empowering, liberating, and transformative solidarity. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much for your intriguing and thought-provoking. Um, as I said earlier, I think we, we uh, will have a short conversation while we wait for um, the first questions to come in, if that's okay with you. Um, yeah, so um, I was really intrigued by this idea of um, uh, or this, uh, by the reframing of the oppositional ideas of freedom and solidarity that you explained uh, earlier in your talk. Um, and this idea of merciful solidarity, I was um, wondering then, I mean, it's because later on um, in your reading of free enterprise, you talk about this idea of power relations as well. Could you maybe expand a little bit on what the change or the shifts are uh, if we consider solidarity as being merciful, is there a shift in power relations that takes place? Uh, certainly, <laughs> certainly there is, a, um, there is a compelling call for a redefinition of power itself, uh, exactly uh, as uh, the story of uh, the abolitionist uh, insurrection engaged uh, by Mary Ellen and Annie explains, uh, the aim is not taking over power. The, aiming, the aim is figuring out how to share it. And this uh, compels us uh, to redefine also these uh, concepts uh, in non-hierarchical ways. Because the traditional definition of, uh, of solidarity is the operatic either, you know, economic money. Look, look at the impasse in Europe. It's either the Euro or uh, we're all good and stick together. Uh, and it's never worked, uh, this either or idea. It's never worked, I believe, also within the history of um, faith, uh, the idea that mercy should be delivered by an authority handed down 
to pardon, to forgive uh, the sinful. Um, it is taking over the idea of power altogether by describing power outside uh, of uh, the hierarchy. Yes, in that sense, uh, uh, it is the epistemic turn that is invoked by the, the philosophers that I have mentioned, uh, although uh, probably in a confusing way. Uh, but, um, and, and that's why uh, it makes sense to me to put together these two concepts, uh, the, the Christian concept of mercy and uh, the classical and then uh, modern concept of solidarity, uh, no, which get redefined not only by being put together, but it is possible to put them together precisely because we have redefined them, precisely because we have redefined solidarity as no longer operatic, huh? when it is uh, uh, both and instead of being either or, and when we have redefined mercy as being unexpected, gratuitous, uh, you know, uh, the motherly love that doesn't want a justification, is just given no matter what, is even given as in Toni Morrison's uh, novel, in order to hand over her girl to another slave holder. Because the calculation there tells her this is the lesser evil. Um, it is in that making together, or oh, the story of the elephants. Uh, I wish you could read uh, the, the wonderful, this, fa this fable or unfable of, you know, the elephants who we, we admire at the beginning of this fable because uh, they are so democratic. They don't even have uh, a nation, a country. They just walk freely in the savannah and they're called the, the walking beings. But then precisely through their encounter with the bears, so they have to redefine their values, their powers, and everything. And they even, even the elephants say, let's go home. You know, nomadic people are not supposed to have a home. <laughs> Sorry, I'm probably going all over the place here. <laughs> well, I, I would like to, since there is the first question here, I'll, I'll extend that. And I, I have a lot of other questions that I'll ask them in the end. Uh, so the first one would be, uh, you spoke at the beginning about relationality and transnationality. Uh, you opened up a global space with that. What makes this space tolerant and inclusive in your sense? So this might even tie in with uh, the fable you were just uh, talking about. Yes, so what makes the space uh, uh, global? But I didn't understand the word you said. Um, so, what makes the space tolerant and inclusive in your sense? Uh, precisely because it's relational, it is inclusive. Uh, uh, but relational does not mean uh, having some uh, abstract values uh, to refer to. Relation is not successful because uh, the two parties believe uh, in goodness. But because the two parties uh, are ready to listen to each other, to learn another language, to rename the world uh, in a third language that comes out of the encounter between the two, relationality uh, cannot be um, contained within any boundaries, uh, neither boundaries of uh, mm, uh, you know, personal identity, national identity. No, because it's temporal. It's temporal and it is contextual. And that's why it is imperfect. But um, it's being imperfect allows us to step out uh, of the impasse of modernity. Modernity, you know, progress, perfection. It's built on these ideals. Let's accept uh, 
imperfection. Let's live uh, our temporality. And if we really need to believe uh, in some kind of immortality, let us learn to see it in the ongoing temporality of humanity. Let's put it horizontally instead of vertically. I think that this um, also then ties in with, um, yeah, because there's a question about utopian vision and I think that is uh, very clear. So um, one of the students writes, your comments, especially about slavery, seem to be more than a normative claim. Uh, so is this rather to be understood as um, said utopian vision? Um, perhaps uh, again, I would like to return to the elephants and the fable is both utopian and dystopian. We cannot separate the two. There are many dystopic stories that help us see through the problems of the present uh, that open the way to utopian as well. Uh, it's, it's another attempt uh, to get out uh, of inherited dichotomies. So um, there are always forms of slavery uh, that replicate themselves, that reproduce themselves generation after generation. And as Annie is thinking about uh, slavery in post-slavery US context, uh, she is reading on the newspaper about lynchings. Uh, and lynchings are, of course, a form of slavery, as much as uh, mass incarceration is a form of slavery nowadays. So we need to learn to, uh, to see things in context, uh, and we need to ask uh, the different unexpected questions. I find it very compelling when uh, Brian Stevenson says, uh, you know, when we face the question of uh, capital punishment, which is enforced in many states in the United States still, the question we should ask is not, does the criminal deserve to die? The question we should ask is, uh, do we deserve to kill? And that is a paradigmatic shift that uh, takes us out uh, also of uh, the utopia that has uh, shown only one aspect of the history of slavery. John Brown has become a hero, right? We know everything about, everybody knows John Brown, at least the name. Uh, and not too many people know about the complexity of the history of slave rebellions uh, throughout the centuries. John Brown has become a hero precisely because he personifies this romantic idea that uh, uh, we have the fighter liberating the slaves uh, and either sending them back to Africa or uh, giving them uh, uh, the promised land on earth, uh, you know, the kingdom of God. One way or the other is taking them out uh, of the relations that make lived lives. And that's, uh, that's why I think uh, Michelle Cliff's narrative is important because she retells John Brown's story without John Brown uh, and without the utopia of getting rid, there's no utopia about getting rid of slavery. We just need, need to deal with it pragmatically on an everyday basis. So would you say that uh, Michelle Cliff in Free Enterprise also um, in, in a way reformulates or reconceptualize um, how we, st we tell stories or um, how literature and, and stories um, as a form of sharing can be used or seen as a form of sharing as opposed as for instance, the role of literature um, in, in colonial uh, in colonial conquest as actually 
um, installing colonial rule and propagating ideo colonial ideologies. So is she is she doing something? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And I thank you very much for this question. Um, because obviously I didn't uh, clarify this point well enough. Um, the narrative uh, starts uh, with the encounter between Mary Ellen and, uh, and Annie. So it starts as a dialogue, continues with the story circle. So it's story after story after story that unfolds uh, to go on as letters letters that are exchanged. At this point, uh, you know, in this plurivocal exchange uh, of narratives that are never formulated by a speaking eye, but always by a speaking eye with a speaking you. Subjectivity is redefined here. Dahlmeier says we, re we need to redefine the subject-object relationship to recast a notion of modernity to tackle the problems of the present time. Uh, yes, that's exactly what, uh, uh, what Cliff uh, is doing here. There's no I that can speak without a you. I am speaking because you're listening to me and you are very, very generous in listening to me, but otherwise I wouldn't be speaking. So I couldn't be saying I. And this is an, an epistemic uh, shift that was already, by the way, uh, theorized in the 70s by Lucy Rigaray. So it's, you know, in, enough of the Cartesian, I think therefore I am, but I exist because you're listening to me. We are relational because we're mammals, uh, because we're two before becoming, before being born. <laughs> and I mean, also discussion. Yes, but the I and the you is really a technique of uh, narration that uh, Cliff masters uh, in so many ways. And at a certain point, uh, she must include in her historical fiction poetry mm -hmm. because poetry is of course uh, that rhetorical mode that allows you to say one thing and another at the same time. You mentioned listening and I think this fits in very well with another question that came in um, because of course we can only listen to stories or read stories if we can actually access them. And um, this is the question about access here. Um, so the question is, we are seeing a rapid increase in publications on topics related to African-American history. Um, in terms of African-American culture, how important is the role of resources to publish at all? So this idea of, of publication, also if we, I would connect that also to uh, Phyllis Wheatley, you, um, yeah. Yeah, of course, we, we need to be able to have a, a channel. Um, well, Phyllis Whitley was uh, a slave, uh, apparently kidnapped uh, um, when she was seven. And we could say a little bit luckier than many others because she ended up uh, as uh, a house slave in a family that was uh, probably in need of a child, who knows <laughs> what the motivation psychologically were there. But uh, the family that was, that marveled at her intelligence. Uh, they probably marveled at her intelligence, her parent, her, her, her masters, uh, because they had bought the slave uh, uh, rhetoric uh, that slaves are not human. Slaves are subhuman. So when they discovered that she could, uh, you know, imitate sonnets, uh, read and write, 
they decided to favor publication in England, not in the United States of her writings. It was not accepted in the USA at the time and it was in the colonies, pardon me. And this is what exactly Toni Morrison has repeated um, for many, many years. Uh, when we look at uh, the history of slavery, we don't go to the archive uh, and find books uh, and find documents. Uh, it's, a kind, it's a different kind of historiography that we need to make. Uh, yes, uh, it's oral history, but oral history, of course, has a limitation in time. You can't go back uh, uh, more than one generation because you won't be able to interview anybody. Uh, yes, there are the songs, uh, but the question uh, Toni Morrison says uh, is that, that there are too many silences, too many holes in our history, and that's where we need to rememory. We need to use fiction. We need to use imagination. And um, it seems to me that uh, what this kind of narratives uh, that... Uh, take us uh, out uh, of what is clear on the one hand uh, and uh, what is invisible on the other and accept uh, walking along the line on that very risky border in a kind of precarious equilibrium that uh, helps us uh, find the unexpected, uh, uh, what they are pointing out uh, that it, yes, it is possible to write history also by imagining it. If Toni Morrison had never written her novel Beloved, not as many people would know about, uh, you know, the, the history of, uh, of that baby, of her sister, of her mother. And yes, she had to imagine it. She had to put herself uh, in the place of a woman who in the face of violence decides that it is better to kill her baby instead of uh, letting her live under slavery. A whole novel is built around that. And it's built around uh, all the historical documents that are available, but it fills in lots of silences with fiction. And that's why, you know, history and fiction and fiction as history, the way that Cliff mixes the two of them in all of her characters, eh, I think is uh, epistemically important. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have a lot of uh, more questions, but we're running out of time. So I'll ask um, a final question. Um, that might tie in with this idea also of uh, what is what what do we have to do not only to reimagine but also to um, be able to foster solidarity and the question is do you think it's a question of making visible uh, or of speaking um, um, a specific voice that takes to show solidarity uh, or is there a specific mindset that is needed for a solidarity? Probably the specific mindset that is needed is that which takes us uh, out of the ampas, subject versus object. The cogito ergo sum, the I, the speaking I and the world, the individual and society. Again, it's trying to step out of this inherited dichotomies uh, that uh, will allow us uh, to see that uh, solidarity could also translate as freedom. Because uh, um, let's just mm, conclude with a brutal example. Uh, the natives feel invaded by the immigrants. 
I am sure this is an experience that uh, is comparable in Italy as much as it is in Germany. We have heard this repeatedly. Uh, many studies show us uh, that uh, many of our societies need the immigrants uh, in order to be better societies. So once you understand that the sharing of what you have is to the advantage of everybody, solidarity is not just an act of charity, of goodness uh, delivered by a sovereign down to the uh, marginalized, but it becomes uh, actually a, an act that makes you more free, that makes you happier, more free. So freedom, individual freedom and solidarity, if everybody feels better, like in the story of the elephants. The story of the elephants in the end, when the elephants, the, the nomadic elephants say, let's go home. And the bears are like, oh my God, you know, uh, you know, the bears thought that they were uh, the only owners of the island. It's to the advantage of everybody. They exchange. They exchange what they have. Their context changes, gets enriched towards something that was not known before. Nobody had seen before elephants wearing furs during the winter. But elephants usually do not go to an island where there is winter, but now they had to in order to escape war. And the bears decide to go to the barber and take their furs off because uh, they're going into their caves and lethargy. <laughs> and the elephants help them. <laughs> fix their caves for their winter. Uh, and that's to the advantage of everybody. Great advantage for the bees, not that the elephants are on the island and, you know, their poop makes so many flowers bloom that the bees are super happy. There's much more freedom for everybody through solidarity. It's just a matter of casting it outside of the juxtaposition between subject and object. I hope I have answered this final question. And thank you so much for this um, call for solidarity that I think we're in dire need for um, yeah. in these times. So thank you so much um, for, for your talk and for you know, talking to us, talking to, uh, responding to students' questions, for being here with us. Um, and also thank you um, to um, the audience in front of your computer screens all over the world. Um, and so, um, Giovanna, for, it, is, it was wonderful, um, and we're so grateful for you taking time to talk to us and with us. Uh, and also, thank you for your important scholarly and activist work. Um, we will continue our Monday night conversations on solidarity uh, next week with writer and activist winner of the prestigious Ingeborg Bachmann Prize, Sharon Dodua Otto. On January 18th, uh, Sharon will be talking about for those who have been in crisis. It will be both a talk and a conversation followed by your questions and comments. Um, so it just remains for me to say thank you and good night to everyone in this part of the world and have a good day to those of you in other time zones. Thank you.